This is 34. When you come to this chapter, Bible teachers are uh, not exactly enthused about the prospect of preaching Genesis 34. Uh, in fact, the attitude seems to be, why don't we just skip this chapter altogether and move on to chapter 35? In fact, one commentator went so far as to say this. He said, he, he didn't comment on chapter 34. He went to chapter 35 and he said this, we pass over the sad record of the intervening chapter, 34. I'm going to pass right over it. Asking our readers to turn to it for themselves. In other words, chapter 34 is not really worth preaching, but uh, you, know, you can read it for yourself if you want to. In his opinion, that was the case. I mean, after all, the chapter does deal with what Dr. Martin said, total depravity. It does deal with lust and rape and anger and deception and greed and family conflict and all these things. And so some would say, and some have said, uh, really, we shouldn't preach this passage to the church. But isn't the Bible filled with descriptions of what we call total depravity? Isn't it especially everywhere recorded all over the scripture, everywhere? So I say, welcome to the real world. This is the world we live in. Chapter 34 is the world, is what the world is, and, and, and maybe a, a microcosm of it. And uh, one thing I like about the Bible is its refusal, refusal to shy away from sinful events like this, the reality of life. This is the reality of life. And the sacred scripture makes no bones about talking about the rebellious acts of sinners and saints alike. Sometimes that's only separated by a thin line. It's not even one mention of the name of God in this chapter, if you heard Dr. Martin read the passage. Not even one mention of the name of God or of the Lord in this whole episode, but what do we say about that? What do we say about all this business of, should we preach this passage? Well, we say that all scripture is inspired and is what? It's profitable. And this chapter is as well. Now, chapter 34 is not just a random story in the Jacob narrative uh, you may to, to be used just for filler. It bears a relationship to what preceded it and to what follows it. And what precedes it are the promises of God to Jacob and his descendants. All, all this time in Genesis, we've been, since chapter 12, we've been talking about the Abrahamic covenant and the promises of God to the patriarchs. Uh, they were promised they would be blessed. They, would, they were promised they would be numerous. It was promised to them they would inherit the land and uh, they, they would be a blessing to the nations. But have you noticed from Genesis 12 on, it seems as though those promises could unravel any time due to the foolish actions of even the patriarchs and their families and the things they do, and not to mention the Canaanite, evil Canaanite nations uh, or influence, I say those promises can unravel except for one fact, the Lord's not going to let them unravel. He will keep his promises. Now, in Genesis 34, these promises are again at stake, as you can see as the, the chapter was read there, uh, due to the ungodly influence of the Canaanites and also the failure of Jacob's family. And so... The testimony of their family was, was, was a failure in this chapter. It goes to show that if the promises made in the Abrahamic covenant are going to succeed, that it's going to be because of the Lord himself. And that's why, not because of Jacob or his sons. Now tonight, and by the way, I have the notes back there. There are two pages, one set vertical, the next set horizontal, and vertical and horizontal. So if you get all that confused, it's, all, it's game over on the notes. They're in the back, though. Um, Tonight, I want to present the chapter under two main headings. Number one, the crime against Jacob's daughter. Number two, the revenge of Jacob's sons. First of all, the crime against Jacob's daughter. That's in the first seven verses. Now, in, at the end of chapter 33, the last couple of verses, verses 18 through 20, uh, Jacob returns to the land just as the Lord told him. He wants to go back to the land of Canaan. He is back in the land of Canaan uh, from his relative Laban up north. He settled down in a city called Shechem. He buys some property there from two guys named Hamor and Shechem. He then builds an altar there. By the way, uh, his grandfather Abraham built an altar in the same place, Shechem, when he first came to the land of Canaan. And so Jacob does the same thing. So far, so good. What could possibly go wrong? Well, right off the bat, we have a rape. The rape of Dinah, verses, verses 1 through 7, as, the, as Dr. Martin read, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. When Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the land, saw her, he took her, lay, her, lay with her, and uh, by force. And so uh, we, have the, uh, this, we have the name of Dinah mentioned again. Now, by this time, that name may be a vague memory to you of the past. Very little has been said about Dinah. Who's Dinah? Well, very little has been said about her. 
Uh, Twelve children were born to Jacob back in chapters 29 and 30. Uh, He had 11 sons and one daughter. Here's the one daughter, Dinah. All the sons back in those chapters, if you recall, they were all given a a name, a meaning to their name. A son would be born, and and the scripture says, and this name means such and such. But when it came to Dinah, she was born, no meaning attached to the name. Birth notice is very uh, sketchy, nothing much is said about her. And then you go to chapter 32, verse 22, and Jacob is getting ready to cross the river Jabbok, and it says in chapter 32, verse 22, now Jacob arose that same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his 11 children, and he crossed the fort of the Jabbok, 11 children. But there are 12 children, not 11, uh, but there are, there are 11 sons. And so I think and I believe, I'm sure, the one not included is Dinah, uh, because uh, why? Probably because she's not going to be ahead of one of the tribes of Israel. The other 11 are, and then they're going to have another brother later on, Benjamin, who's going to round that out to have the 12 tribes of Israel represented. So far, Dinah has been uh, relegated to uh, the place of obscurity. Not much has been said. But now, in chapter 34, Dinah finally gets some press, although I'm sure she'd rather stay out of the news at this point, given what's happened here. Dinah decides one day, I need to get out of the house. I need to go visit, look at verse 1, visit the daughters of the land. The word is, for visit is actually see. I need to see the daughters of the land. Now, that sounds innocent enough. And in and of itself, it is an innocent thing, I guess. But as to the wisdom of her action, I have to question that. According to verse 2, she's in Hivite territory. Hivites are an ethnic group within the greater uh, Canaanite community. Hivites are Canaanites, in other words. Canaanites will later be denounced by the Lord for their evil practices. They already have been denounced in Genesis. And they do not fail to live up to their reputation in this setting in Genesis 34. The word visit or see means more than just a friendly how do you do. It means to look over something, to look at something. So this is a more prolonged look. It appears that Dinah really wants to go get to know the women of the the daughters of the land. Uh, in a better way. She maybe wants to get to know their ways better. I don't think she's trying to get into, get into trouble, per se. I just think she's treading on thin ice a little bit. In fact, many commentators take note of that, that this is, some even say this was inappropriate, what she did, and some even say that you had to have a chaperone. Uh, if, a, if a girl was unmarried, she had to have a chaperone to go out with her. Better to avoid the Canaanite community altogether. You remember what Rebecca said about the Canaanite women. Uh, that uh, her uh, son Esau had married uh, about Esau's two Hittite wives, not Hivite, but Hittite wives. Back in Genesis 27, 46, he said, she said, I am tired of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth like these from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Daughters of the land, whether they're Hittites, Hivites, they're still Canaanites, always a problem. Genesis 28, 8 says the daughters of Canaan displeased Isaac. Daughters of Canaan. Genesis 26.35 states that the same women, the Canaanite women, were a bitterness of spirit to Isaac and Rebekah. So this this is a problem. Canaanite people are a problem to the budding nation of Israel. Just taking verse 1 by itself, before the incident in verse 2 happens, before it even happens, I'm thinking, this is not a good idea. I don't see this as being a great idea. Dinah is placing herself in a, a position of spiritual danger by going, by, by going to people who are known for their idolatry. They're known for their evil and moral practices. She's going to visit them. She's going to go see them, take a, a prolonged visit with them. Many people think at this point she's, between, she's a young teenager, maybe between the ages of 13 and 15. And so... In fact, look at verse 4. Shechem calls her a young girl in the NASB, or just technically a girl. Uh, and, and, and I have to ask the question, where's the parental guidance at? What about Jacob and Leah? Oh, yeah, they don't live together. That's right. J- Jacob is living with Rachel. He may not even be aware that his daughter, his one daughter, is going out to see the daughters of the land. As for Leah, the mother of Dinah, where's she at? Where's her oversight of her only daughter? This is her only daughter. Now, I don't know if she escaped out of the tent or what she did, but she's out there looking for the daughters of the land. I bring this all up, and yes, 
I do believe this is what's happening. This is not a good scenario in verse 1 at all. I, I bring this up to say, please don't take this lightly. Parents need to know what and with whom their children are involved. They really know. And teenagers need guidance and oversight. Unless they're gonna, they'll, they'll get into absolute mess, as you should know, and, and a ruin. And I understand we should give them some room to grow. By the way, I know as kids grow up, give them a little bit of room to grow. I get that. But be very careful that you are not absent or neglectful of your responsibilities in this area. Very important. God puts you there as a parent to lovingly nurture your children, to guide them, to give them an understanding of the dangers of this world system. I don't know what Jacob and Leah are doing at this time. And know this, know that when a female child goes out to see the daughters of the land, she herself will no doubt be seen by the sons of the land. That's going to happen. And that's what happens here. Okay, that's natural. However, uh, this is a bad situation. We've already been in, introduced to these fine, upstanding citizens, Shechem and Hamor, back in Genesis 33, 8, 19. Shechem is the son of Hamor, and he's a prince of a man, isn't he? Or is he? Verse uh, 2 says he was the prince of the land. So Shechem is in a position of power, and, and it looks as though that power has gone to his head because he feels the freedom to violate Dinah. Now notice the verbs in verse 2. He saw her. Shechem did. Saw Dinah. He took her. He lay with her by force. Literally, he humbles her. He humiliates her. He takes her by violence. You may recognize that pattern. The same pattern is found in Genesis 3, 6 regarding Eve in the Garden of Eden. Uh, it says there, the woman saw the tree was good for food. She took from its fruit. She ate. Same pattern. That's typically the pattern we see, you know, throughout the scriptures in regard to sin. That's what we must, be guard, we must guard ourselves against. When, when it comes to sin, here's how it goes. Seeing. See something you want. Taking. You take it. Uh, partake of it. And then the evil deed is done. And that's why sin must be called at level one, the sight. <coughs> sight. When you see it, the, here's the problem. Sight leads to covetousness which leads to getting that object you're coveting, which leads to indulging in sin. And that's how the pattern of sin goes here, as it does in many places in Scripture. Now, some have questioned whether this was an actual, actual rape. I don't understand how these guys can say, well, was this an actual, actual rape? Was it consensual or what it was? No need to ask the question. It's an obvious rape. The whole t chapter, the tone of the whole chapter is, gives us that information, especially verse, verse 7. And this is not only rape, but in 21st century America, it would no doubt be considered statutory rape. Now, back then, they were younger when they got married and so on. Still, it's a rape. Now, there's somewhat, I start immediately, I thought of the parallel story in 2 Samuel 13, where you have Amnon, a son of David, who uh, falls in love with his half-sister, Tamar. And it says he loves her, he craves her, he loves her, he goes on like that. And then it says, after he rapes her. And then after that, it says he, after he does this, it says he, he hated her with a great hatred. <laughs> Everything changed. That's not what happens here, though. Um, now, after this incident, Shechem wants to marry Dinah. He's madly in love with her. Now, my guess is this guy has a harem. He's building. He wants to include Dinah in that collection. But there's something lacking in Shechem here, and what is that? Something very obvious. Repentance. There's no sorrow over sin for what he did. There's no regret. There's not, there's not even a shred, a shred of remorse, no guilt. Look what he tells his father in verse 4. Get me this young girl for a wife. Like an order he gives his father. This is who I want. Thou get her for me. Isn't that the way of the godless, though? Isn't that how they act? The way of the godly involves being moved to repentance, becoming sorrowful to the point of repentance. But the way of the ungodly is eh, at the best remorse, maybe. And for Shechem, not even that. He doesn't care. He just wants her as his wife now. No mention of repentance, no repentance whatsoever. That's the rape. Now notice the reactions in verses 5 to 7. Notice Jacob's reaction in verse 5, first of all. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, but his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob kept silent until he came in. Somehow, Jacob hears this news about Dinah, he, we don't know how, he decides to keep quiet until his sons come in from the field so he can tell them about it. But here's what I don't get about Jacob's reaction. Normally when a daughter is raped, wouldn't you think the father would be enraged? Right? Wouldn't you think he'd be outraged, you know, angry, sorrowful, 
emotionally distraught, uh, intent on justice, all these emotions mixed into one, that's how he would feel, yes, I think that would be a typical reaction. I don't see that from Jacob in this verse or in the rest of the whole chapter. It's not just this verse. I don't see it at all. In fact, it says here, he hears about it, verse 5. He heard about it, and that's it. He keeps silent. Doesn't say anything here. And, and that's all we're told concerning his reaction throughout the entire chapter. Nothing else. It's a, it just seems unnatural to me. We're talking about a daughter being defiled here. Shechem defiling, making Dinah un, unclean, impure. She didn't stub her toe. This is serious business. And yet, all we get out of Jacob is, well, he hears about it. And then he's silent. But while he is silent, Hamor, the father of Shechem, is ready to talk. Look at verse 6. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. should have been the other way around. It should have been Jacob running to Hamor to speak with him. That's not what happens here. Shechem, you remember Shechem had said, hey, I want her to be my wife. Father, can you please get her my, or not please, definitely get her for my wife, whether you like it or not. And he goes to do that. He goes to request that of Jacob, and there's no recorded response from Jacob. That's his reaction. And then there's the reaction of Jacob's sons. Look at verse 7. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. The men were grieved, and they were very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing ought not to be done. The sons apparently heard about this incident before they got home from work, and it must have been the talk of the town because Jacob hears about it. His sons hear about it. And two statements are described very well their feelings. Look what it says in verse uh, 7, the men were grieved. Now, this particular use of the word, word grieved occurs only one time, uh, other time in the Old Testament, in Genesis 6, 6, where it says the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Same word here. God was hurt inwardly. God was literally hurt inwardly that he had made man on the earth, and he was felt pain inwardly. And that's exactly what Jacob's sons felt. Now, that's how they, they should react. It says they were grieved, and they were angry, fit to be tied, just enraged. And so that's what we should have had out of Jacob. That's how Jacob should have reacted, but it seems like Jacob is somewhat indifferent. I think he's concerned. I've got to be concerned. This is his only daughter, but not really, it doesn't seem like. And I think the reason is, is I think... I, I'm sure of it. He does not have a close, close relationship with his daughter. He just doesn't. Why do I say that? Because Leah is not his favorite wife. Remember this? We go back to this problem in earlier chapters of having all these multiple wives and all this stuff, children from different wives. Guess what? That creates all kinds of problems. Leah's not his favorite wife. Rachel is. That's his real wife. He lives with Rachel, not Leah. I think his indifference stems from a lack of a serious relationship with his daughter. So he doesn't get all bent out of shape about it. Again, men, I cannot stress to you the importance of a vital, having a vital relationship with your sons and daughters. Don't be like Jacob here. Don't be like Jacob. Spend time with them. Cultivate a relationship with them. This is serious business. This is laying the groundwork for everything else that happens. What, what, go to their sporting events, their plays, whatever it is they do. Go to those things. Love them. Encourage them. Uh, get out of, come out of your world. And get into their world. I know this is difficult. And be with them. They need you desperately. They need your leadership. They need your love. They need your encouragement. They need your guidance. Don't let everything under the sun become your priority over that. And so Jacob's sons react in a way that is proper, as people should react to these things. And then thirdly, there's the reaction of Moses. Verse 7. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Isn't Moses in Exodus somewhere? You know, by a burning bush or something, what is he doing over here? Because he wrote the book. He wrote the book, and, and he's the author. Look what he adds to this discussion at the end of verse 7. They're talking about Jacob. He's talking about Jacob's sons being upset because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel. And then he says this, For such a thing ought not to be done, almost like the editorial comment. This shouldn't even be done. A disgraceful thing. The phrase has to do with a... Willful sin that is stupid and senseless. That's actually the lexical, the uh, dictionary uh, definition. A sin that is stupid and senseless. It's folly. Then he adds, such a thing ought not to be done. Why would you even consider doing this? There's a parallel to this in 2 Samuel, again, 13, verse 12. Tamar 
when Tamar saw that her half-brother Amnon was going to rape her, she said this, Do not violate me, for such a thing is not to be done in Israel. Don't you know this is forbidden? I mean, it's an obvious no-brainer. Anybody with any sense of right and wrong knows that rape is, is something that should not be done. It's a horrible thing. It's deeply, uh, it's, it scars the person emotionally. It's a disgrace. It's a shameful act. What does this make the prince? It makes him a fool. He's a senseless fool is what he is. That's how Moses reacts to Shechem's sin in his comment. It's, in fact, it's how the Lord reacts because Moses is writing this. Uh, uh, this is inspired scripture. And he's writing the Lord's thoughts. And so even though the name of the Lord is not mentioned here, his holiness is shining through. It's coming through loud and clear. This thing shouldn't even be done. Even if, we, even if patriarchs are indifferent to sin, the Lord is not. And so we have the crime against Dinah. Secondly, the revenge of Jacob's sons. In the rest of the chapter, 8 to 31, the revenge of Jacob's sons. Now, this section is headed up, first of all, by a proposal by the Hivites in verses 8 to 12, a proposal. Look at verse 8. Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us. Give your daughters to us. Take our daughters for yourselves. Thus you shall live with us, and the land shall be open before you. Live and trade in it and acquire property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, If I find favor in your sight, then I will give whatever you say to me. Ask me ever so much bridal payment and gift, and I will give according as you say to me. But give me the girl in marriage. Now, originally, this was to be a private conversation between Hamor. Hamor approaches uh, Jacob in verse 6 to talk to him. But when Jacob's sons catch wind of the news, uh, they, now, they, they come home from work, they, they hear about it. Now they are involved in the conversation. Look at verse 8. Hamor spoke with them. Verse 6, he spoke with him. Jacob, now he speaks with them, everybody. His argument that, hey, my son's madly in love with Dinah. He longs for her. It's a, it's a similar idea to verse 3. He's deeply attracted to her. You know, it used to be when a man, uh, people used to say this back in the day, some man was in love with a woman, and they would say, oh, he's pining for her. You ever heard that phrase? He's pining away, meaning he can't stand to be without her. He's lost without her completely. That's how Shechem feels. Now, notice what's missing in this argument. No mention of a crime committed at all, nothing about the crime, nothing about a rape by this potential husband. There's no apology. There's no confession. He asked for Dinah's hand in marriage, but that's it. And he fails to mention, what. oh, by the way, that incident that happened earlier. Nothing about that mentioned at all. Hamor and Shechem don't care about Dinah's feelings at all. They do care about Shechem's feelings. Again and again, look, he's in love with her. Nothing said about Dinah's feelings ever. They don't care about that. Now, I would think in this conversation, place yourself in this conversation. I would think Hamor must sense the anger and grief of Jacob's sons. They're angry. They're grieved. We saw that earlier. They're hopping mad. And uh, he said, he said my, look at verse 8. My son longs for your daughter. See the word, my, when it says your daughter? The your here is plural. As if Dinah is not only the daughter of Jacob, he's the daughter of all the sons too. Because all of them are acting like fathers at this point. And so that's how, that's how they're, they're feeling. I wish I could be a fly buzzing around at the time to feel the tension in the air of this conversation to see it. But Hamor has another point to make. He says, in effect, hey, why don't we take this one step further? Why have one marriage? Why don't we, why stop there? Why not all of us intermarry together? We can be one big happy family. In fact, you can buy land from us. You can do business with us. Uh, life is going to be wonderful. Think of how you will benefit. The emphasis is more being on how Jacob and his sons are going to benefit from this arrangement. The interesting thing here is Jacob has only one daughter going to marry your daughters. There's only one daughter. I guess he's talking about future generations. And then Shechem closes the deal with his salesmanship. He says, you know, I'll, if you, I'll give you whatever you say. Whatever dowry you want, I'll pay it. My money's no object. If I can just find favor in your sight and marry the girl. By the way, the, the word translated girl in verse 12 is a different word from the one in verse 4. It's a more, you know, a respectable term. Uh, it's more like a maiden. Uh, in verse uh, 4, uh, Shechem says to his father, get me this girl for a wife. Here he says to Jacob's uh, sons, give me this maiden for a wife. More respectable. He's choosing his words carefully now. 
Something tells me Shechem is not going to find favor in the sight of Jacob's sons. He says that's what he wants. But let me ask you a question. If this were your daughter, would this guy find favor in your sight? Oh, yeah. This would be great. My, son can marry, my daughter can marry a rapist. Now, this negotiation is really based on the desire of one selfish individual, this whole thing. He wants everybody to intermarry and everybody to go through all this uh, sacrifice in this chapter for himself. But did you notice the dangerous, the very dangerous, dangerous proposal that's been made here? He proposes intermarriage. That's what they propose. They propose intermarriage. Now, that's a problem that's going to continue throughout the Old Testament. You're going to see it from time to time. And the Lord, again and again, is going to say, no, no intermarriage with my people, with, the God, with godless people. Not going to have it. Deuteronomy 7, verse 3. The Lord says, you shall not intermarry with Canaanites. You shall not give your daughters to their sons. Nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. That's just the opposite of what Shechem said and what Hamor said. Why? He goes on in Deuteronomy 7 to say, For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. That's exactly what's going to happen. That's why we are always warning people about who they marry and who they partner with and things like this. Be careful. You remember what Abraham said to his servant in Genesis 24 uh, about Isaac? He says, You shall not get a wife for my son Isaac from the Canaanite woman. He, says, he said, here's the quote, you shall not take a wife from my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. There's it again, that phrase again, the daughters of the Canaanites. Don't get a wife from there. Abraham was insistent. He says, I, in fact, I'd rather you travel 550 miles north to get a wife from up there. That's how bad it was. You see, what, what Hamor really wants here is a full partnership with Jacob. And his, he wants an alliance uh, with him and his descendants. So not only would Dinah be defiled, but the budding nation of Israel would be defiled as well. This goes much deeper than the initial story on the surface. You say, what does that got to do with us today? Same problem. Same problem today, establishing a full partnership with people who don't know the Lord. Believers establishing a full partnership and an alliance with people who, who don't know the Lord. People who are idolaters of various gods. We can't, you can't establish a full partnership with those people. Now, that partnership can be sealed in marriage. It can be sealed in business. It can be sealed in a, re in a religion. People, all the religions get together. Let's all get together and all these kind of things. Be very careful of whom you choose as associates. So they propose, this is the proposal of the Hivites. Let's intermarry. And then there's a counter proposal of Jacob's son in verse 13 to 17. Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit because he had defiled Dinah their sister. And then they said to, him, to them, we cannot do this thing to give your sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent with you. If you'll become like us, like that, and that every male of you be circumcised, then we'll give our daughters to you, we'll take your daughters for ourselves, we'll live with you and become one people. That's what, really what the other side wants. But if you will not listen to us and to be uncircumcised, then we will take our daughter and go. Now at this point, look who takes over the negotiations. Jacob's sons. Where's Jacob at? He says nothing. He does nothing. He gives no input. He gives no advi godly advice. He's silent during these negotiations. This is the man that wrestled with God in chapter 32. And now he's sitting on the sidelines, and his sons take over. His sons are fully engaged. They have absolutely no intention of agreeing to this ridiculous proposal, which in one sense is good, that they're not going to intermarry. That's a good thing. But they have another motive in mind. They're, they plan to trick Hamor and his people. And so, verse 13, they answer with deceit. Well, who does that remind you of? That, used, that, was used, that same word was used once before in Genesis 27, 35. When Isaac told his son Esau, your brother Jacob came deceitfully, taking away your blessing. Now Jacob's son, sons resort to their for, father's formal, former deceitful ways. And the reason is, since their sister has been defiled... Why can't they deceive? I mean, isn't all fair in love and war? And that's how they, that's the view they take. So if the Hivites want to marry, it'll be on Jacob's, the, ter the term set not by Jacob, but by Jacob's sons. They must be circumcised. You remember that in Genesis 17, the Lord said to the people under the Abrahamic covenant, you must be circumcised. The sign of the covenant is circumcision. Of course, Jacob's sons have no intention of intermarriage at all. This is a total front they're putting up. Nothing to do with anything. It's just a front 
And then there's the acceptance by the Hivites of this proposal, verse 18. Now, their, their words seemed reasonable to Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. The young, men did not, young man did not delay to do this thing because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now, he was more respected than all the household of his father. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of the city and spoke to the men of the city, saying, These men are friendly with us. Therefore, let them live in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage and give our daughters to them. Only on this condition will the men consent to us to live with us, to become one people. There it is again, to become one people. They, that every male among us be circumcised as they, are, as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock and their property and all their animals be ours? Only let us consent to them and they will live with us. All who went out of the gate of the city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem. Every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. So as you read verses 18 19, you can see how eager Shechem is to marry Dinah. He doesn't even question the, the qualification laid upon him. Oh, you say circumcision? Okay, fine, whatever. He, immediately, he gets that done. He's confident he'll get the men of the town to follow him because look at verse 19. It says the reason he can command respect from other people of the Hivites is because it says he was more respected than all the household of his father. In other words, the most honorable man of the Hivites was this guy, Shechem. Now, if he was the most honorable man they had, I have to ask the question, what would the least honorable man be like? I mean, this guy is, this is the most honorable man among them. He's a rapist. None of the Hivites seem to care. They don't say a word about anything. Why? Because they don't have the same values as the, Lord, as the Lord's people do. Not at all. In fact, the, world's, the world in general does not have the same values as God's people do. Now, most people are going to view rape in an unfavorable light. It's true. But uh, it doesn't always work this way. In fact, take our justice system, for example. <laughs> they are constantly, they don't have any problem allowing serious offenders back on the street after a very short stay in jail. It happens in this city all the time, by the way. Very short stay in jail. Next thing you know, they're back on the street. All kinds of, you've read it, rapists. Murderers, everybody, and their brothers out there on the streets. After just a short time, it happens all the time. Believers view, they view life through the lens of Scripture. Unbelievers view life through the lens of their own sin-cursed condition. They don't value holiness. Not at all. In fact, the, the, they can consider a guy who's a rapist a hero, even. Uh, someone to be praised. So Shechem and his father hold a public meeting with the men of the city to present, to present their case. Their argument is is uh, based on how it will benefit themselves to form an alliance in all these verses 18 and 24. Remember before Hamor uh, emphasized to Jacob, hey, this is going to benefit you. If we intermarry and get together, you can buy our land and uh, trade and business and have property and all that. Uh, but now he says to his own people, wait a minute. If we do this, if we get this alliance going, we'll be the winners. We'll get their property. We'll get their cattle. It's a win-win for us. And so he presents it that way to their selfishness, and the men consent to say, okay, fine, to consent to it. And then you have this atrocity committed by Jacob's sons. Look at verse 25. Now it came about on the third day that when they were in pain that two, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, died as brothers. Each took his sword and came upon the city unawares and killed every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went forth. Now, the text reads that only two of Jacob's sons were involved in this massacre, Levi and Simeon. Later on, Levi is going to do a lot of great things. Here, he's involved in this massacre, and they kill every single male. Now, you might wonder, how is that possible? How did these two guys kill every single male? Well, consider these reasons. First, verse 25 says they waited three days. Now, let me, let me quote this. Uh, from a writer. He says, the third day after the circumcision is the day on which the pain from the operation would be the most intense. The fever that would develop as a result of the operation would only make the condition more intolerable for adults here. So the men of the city were incapacitated at this point. They're most vulnerable. Secondly, we don't know how many males were killed. Exactly. It doesn't say. Maybe it wasn't a tremendous number. We don't know. Thirdly, they took the city by surprise. Verse 29, verse 25, says they came upon the city unawares. Nobody suspected this. Nobody even thought this. Nobody, they didn't have a clue this was going to happen at all. So these two guys come in like madmen with their weapons, kill everybody. 
The Hivites are in an extremely weakened position. Jacob, uh, Levi, and Simeon are glad about this. That's what they wanted, and they kill everybody. Now, two names are highlighted in this massacre. Who are they? Hamor and Shechem. So justice is done as far as Levi and Simeon are concerned, kind of a wild, wild west justice, kind of, you know, hang them high. Let's take matters in our own hands and hang them high. And that's what they did. And now we're told new information. Look at verse 26. Dinah had been held hostage all this time, all the time in the negotiations. She's held captive, held hostage in Shechem's house. And I don't think she wanted to be there. She was kept there during the negotiations. Verse 25 says it was Dinah's brothers. Did you notice that? Dinah's brothers, her, blood, her full brothers. Simeon and Levi are the sons of Levi, sons of Leah, rather. Simeon and Levi are the sons of Leah, just as Dinah was. They're her full brothers. That's why they're so bent on vengeance. They're actually related to her fully. Now, I don't know where the other four full brothers were. Reuben, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. They're not mentioned at all, but two of these guys are really her brothers, full brothers, and they are bent on vengeance. But they don't stop there. <laughs> not, not good enough. They feel the need to loot and plunder. Look at verse 27. Jacob's sons came upon the slain and loot, looted the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and that which was in the city and that which was in the field. And they captured and looted all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives, even all that was in the houses. Now I want you to notice a word here. The word defile has been mentioned three times now. It's mentioned in verse 27. They did this because they defiled their sister. Verse 5, again, defiled Dinah. Verse 13, they defiled Dinah. Everything they do is based on one fact. It's because they defiled their sister. Now, what's ironic is that the, the Hivites had told their people, look, if we, if we intermarry and get with these guys, we're going to get all their property. We're going to get all their cattle. But the ironic thing is that Jacob's sons get all the cattle. They get all the property. They, get all, they, get, and they take their wives and children even. The killing uh, may have been kill, uh, carried out by Simeon and Levi, but it looks, according to verse 27, it looks like all of Jacob's sons are involved in the plunder. I don't think Jacob's sons there are just talking about two sons because it changes the way it describes them. And I think all of them plunder. But there's a rebuke by Jacob in verse 30 and 31. Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And my men, or literally I, it says here, not my men, it says I being few in number, they will gather together against me and attack me. I will be destroyed, I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister as a harlot? Now, there are two words that stand out in verse 30. The words me and I. Look at this. You tell me who Jacob is most concerned with. Verse 30. Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have got trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanite and the Perizzites, and I, being few in number, they will gather together against me, they're going to attack me, and I will be destroyed, I, oh, and by the way, my household too. He says, you brought, brought trouble on me. You two guys are, are trying to bring me down. You're going to bring disaster on me. You've made me odious among the, the Canaanite inhabitants. That word odious is used in Exodus 7 to describe dead fish that stink. You're going to make me like dead fish that stink. It's, it's used in Exodus 16 to describe rotten bread. That's, Jacob feels like, I'm going to be odious like that. That's what you've made me like in the land now. He's thinking of his own reputation. Think about this. He's thinking of his reputation, but he's not thinking of who else, whose reputation, his daughter's. Nothing about that at all. But my reputation is important. He believes that various tribal groups are going to get together and attack him and totally destroy his household. And Jacob's sons in the chapter by saying, should he treat our sister as a harlot? What a great question. Now, what do we say about all this? Well, let me give you a few observations. We'll wrap it up. Number one, Jacob's sons were right to seek justice for their sister. They were right to seek justice for their sister. Their grief and anger, verse 7, are very understandable. If, I, if this is my sister, I'd feel the same way. Anybody who knows God at all would. I'd be grieved in anger, too. There's such a thing, by the way, as righteous anger. Righteous, that's when you're mad about stuff you should be mad about. Sometimes we're mad about things we have no right to be mad about, but this we should be mad about. We should be angry over the things the Lord is angry about. You say, how do I know what to be mad about? Be mad about what God's mad about. You'll be okay. 
the things that should not be done. Be mad about those things. It should always grieve and anger us when people violate the scriptures and do harm to others as a result. That should always trouble us. As God's people, we understand we're made in the image of God. And so if someone is harmed that way, it should trouble us. And so here you have, so they have the question, should he treat our sister as a harlot? Is that what you want, Father? That's a piercing question right there. Absolutely not. They're 100% correct in their attitude. Secondly, Jacob's sons were wrong in how they accomplished their goal. They're wrong in how they accomplished their goal. They used deceit. God's people don't have to resort to deceit and lies for any reason to write any kind of situation. We don't, we don't do that. A question, here's a question you asked yourself. You used to hear this question years ago. Is it ever right to do wrong in order to do, to do right? Is it ever right to do wrong in order to do right? Some people would say, yes, it is. But I, I'd say the answer for God's people is no, it's not. We confront justice head on. There's no, we don't have to play games with this. They, they did. They, did they, used to, they resorted to deceit instead of confronting it head on. Secondly, they used overkill, and I do mean that literally. Did they have to kill every single male? They really have to do that? I mean, later in Joshua, the Israelites will be told to exterminate all the Canaanites. This is kind of a precursor of that. But that command has not yet been given. It hasn't been given yet. There's only one man committed the crime. Now, you could say the other men of Shechem were, uh, Shechem's men were complicit in this because they never did anything to take any uh, justice on their own prince, but they're not going to anyway. But only one guy committed the crime. He should be punished alone. Now, as to how they punish him, I would have no idea, but... Uh, to kill every male, I don't think, was the answer. Thirdly, they plundered the city. Was that really necessary? To loot and, and go hog wild, plundering and looting everything, including wives and children, going way beyond the crime, and it shows they're reckless abandon. I get it. I get it. I do understand this. They're very angry. Okay, I understand that. But it's one thing to express righteous anger. Remember Jesus in the temple when he overturned the tables of the money changers? He expressed righteous anger, very angry in a righteous way. But he knew where to stop. He knew how far to take it. And we're not Jesus anyway. But it's, quite, it's, it's another thing to lose all self-control for the purpose of revenge. This is a ball about revenge. Vengeance is mine, I will, will repay, says the Lord. I understand they needed to take justice, but this took, they took it too far. Third observation, Jacob's lack of leadership is absolutely appalling. Where is Jacob in this episode? Verse 5, he hears Dinah has been defiled. Oh, I heard about that. He confronts no one. He says nothing. He does nothing. And his, his, his inaction is probably why his sons had took over the whole show here. He, didn't, he, didn't, he, didn't, he allowed them to deceive people. He didn't try to redirect the situation by a course of wisdom. None of that. And here's what we get from this. When leaders fail to lead wisely in a crisis situation, when they, lead, when they fail to lead wisely in a crisis situation, the followers may well be led by their own misguided zeal. It's happened throughout history all the time. Followers of a, of a leader who went kind of hog wild doing their own thing because they weren't led properly. Genesis 49, Jacob will not have any kind words to say about Levi and Simeon and his prophecy. But that's a, another sermon for another day. Right now, things aren't looking too good for Jacob, uh, as far as he's concerned. He feels the whole world's against him. The whole world's going to rise up against him and attack him. Will, he, will his family survive? Will he survive? Will the promises of God survive? We're going to find out in the next chapter, but let me, let me tell you this as we close. If the promises of God made to the patriarchs are ever going to be fulfilled, it is not because the patriarchs are outstanding spiritual giants. It won't be because of Jacob and his sons. It'll be because of the Lord himself promised to fulfill them, and he will fulfill them. That's why it's going to happen. In the same way in our generation, we're counting on the Lord to fulfill his word. We're not counting on, we're not counting on men, people. Look, we love men, the people that serve and that worship Christ and that lead us and all that. I, I know that. But we're counting on ultimately the Lord to do this. So I love the hymn, the arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Even the best of men, what did J.C. Rawls say, whoever said it before he did? The best of men are men at best. That's all they are. So who do we trust? We trust the Lord. First Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 1.20, I love this verse. 
For as many as are the promises of God and Christ, they are yes. In other words, the promises of God are going to fulfill, find their fulfillment in Christ and because of Christ and because of him alone. The great need for us is to depend upon the Lord and not to resort to our own devices. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we're grateful for your word. Pray that Lord will trust you this week. Lord, we know that we have failed so many times in our life. We failed other people also, and we ask your forgiveness for these things. But we just pray, Lord, that you will give us the grace and strength to trust you. We know that, uh, Lord, that we're, you're the one we need to put confidence in, that we need to look to, that we need to depend on 100% of the time completely. We pray you'll work on our behalf for your glory. Praise in Christ's name. Amen.